good morning. I'm Darian Louie, the Executive Director for the East Bay EDA. And now I'd like to introduce our chair, the Honorable Keith Carson. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, before I start, I really want to say a big thank you to Darian and to the staff of East Bay EDA um, for not just uh, the work that you put in for today's event, but the work that you put on behalf of the East Bay I've, every single day working on your behalf to make this the best place to live, work, and do business. So a big thank you to the East Bay EDA staff. <laughs> Is that a little bit better? Because uh, Dr. C Christopher Thornburg is mic'd up, right? <laughs> mic'd up. Uh, I'd like to say welcome and good morning to everyone, and uh, especially to those who have never attended one of our spring membership uh, meetings of East Bay EDA. How many of you have never been to one of the spring membership meetings? Raise your hand. Well, a special welcome to you, and I think you're in for a big treat in terms of the information that you will walk out of here with today that you can take back to your respective areas and uh, share either with your colleagues or your family members or your communities. Uh, this is one of the, the um, signature events that we host every single year and we look forward to it. So I'd like to formally call to order uh, the spring membership meeting of East Bay EDA for 2017. I want to reiterate what uh, Darian said earlier, and you should feel free to post your thoughts throughout the morning on social media using uh, East Bay EDA's Twitter handle and East Bay EDA and our hashtag uh, EBE Economic Report. EB Economic Report. So put that out so you can tweet out, send out the information uh, in real time as it happens today. We also uh, always give a lot of information out the back, so get your, your the information from the tables at the back, uh, as well as um, we give away a bottle of wine at the end of today's presentation, but you have to be here in order to uh, win. So I think everybody probably put uh, their numbers in a bag, and we'll pick it out a little later on. Um, how many of you are currently members of East Bay EDA? I want you to raise your hand. And I want to thank you for your service uh, within the organization uh, on behalf of the citizens of the East Bay, both Contra Costa and Alameda County, for those who may not still know that we span both Contra Costa and Alameda County. And my colleague, Candace Anderson, who will be on program a little later on from Contra Costa County, as well as David Twa and Susan Muranishi. Uh, we're meeting on a regular basis as two counties with um, the other infrastructure to serve you here. We have a number of elected officials, I understand, that are here, and we're gonna get to you in a few minutes, but um, today you're gonna learn a lot more about the organization, uh, what we do, and then you'll be treated to a presentation, as I said, earlier uh, by Dr. Christopher Thornburg, who will give an overview of the state of the East Bay and the forecast of things to come. And as you leave today, you'll also receive a copy of the 2017 East Bay Economic Outlook Report. Uh, that's one of the other uh, items that we work very hard on during the course of the year to make sure that you can take that data and information. And so not only are you informed, but you'll be able to support that information with real data. Soft copies of the report will also be available through our website, and you can, uh, you can get that next week. I'd like to say a big thank you to the organizations who are supporting us by um, actually funding today's meeting. Uh, most of these uh, businesses that I'm highlighting are very active in the organization, so they don't just contribute money, but they're part of the decision making as well. Bank of America, the Workforce Development Board of Contra Costa County, the Alameda County Social Service Agency, the Alameda County Workforce uh, Development Board, and the East Bay Community Foundation. A big thank you to all of you for helping to fund 
uh, today's um, uh, event as well as being a part of funding the report that uh, people will walk out of here with today. Today's program is being filmed for later broadcast uh, on CCTV covering Contra Costa County, the Tri-Valley, uh, the select cities of Alameda County. And so you'll be able to uh, review that and see that on our website for listings of showings on your local cable station. And this event will also be available for viewing on our website uh, later on uh, as well. Now I'd like to uh, recognize a number of our elected officials who are here today, uh, but they're not just here uh, today because of the information uh, that we'll all walk out of here with. They're here today because they're very active members of East Bay EDA as well, because all of our cities in both Contra Costa and Alameda County, almost all of our cities in both Contra Costa and Alameda counties are active members. Uh, that includes their mayors, their city, uh, infrastructure, their city managers, and others. So I'd like to start again uh, by recognizing my colleague, uh, Supervisor Candace Anderson from Contra Costa County. She's also the vice chair, the second vice chair of East Bay EDA. I just saw uh, Mayor Barbara Holliday of the city of Hayward just walk in in the back, and I want to recognize her as well. Mayor John Marchand of the city of Livermore is also with us. Uh, council member Jennifer Cavana of the city of Piedmont is also with us, and thank you for being with us. We have council person uh, Darlene G from the city of Arinda also here. I want to say thank you very much for being with us. Council member Karen Stepper, I also saw her here earlier um, uh, from Danville. Thank you very much. Uh, I referenced earlier our county administrators um, who really keep the financing of this going on a, in a significant way as well as our dues paying members and uh, also the contributions that we get from business. But I'd like to highlight and recognize Susan Murinishi, uh, one of my bosses here in Alameda County and David Twa, who's in the back as well, and want to say again, thank you. Um, I don't know, have I overlooked uh, some of the elected officials who may have come in and uh, didn't sign in? Um, Barbara, you're raising your hand. Who is also here and want to say thank you. Anyone else? Very active in East Bay EDA, and thank you for being here. Any other? Um, as opposed to pointing, why don't we say who's here? Thank you very much for being here. It's always a tricky thing to catch the elected officials because we slide through sometimes without signing in. But go ahead. Roland Estivias, Hercules. Good morning. Are there any others? And again, I want to say thank you so much uh, for being with us. East Bay EDA is a collaboration of leaders uh, across sectors from the business community, from government, we come together to advance and promote business attraction, retention, and growth. In addition to our business and nonprofit leaders, we have 26 cities in the East Bay who are members of East Bay EDA. We basically do our work through five strategies. We use the power of our cross-sector leadership to provide sustainable solutions and for diverse resources that we also acquire. Our governing arm includes the two county administrators and appointees from the two mayor's conferences in both counties. The two city administrators also are um, selected to represent the cities. The Economic Development Directors Council and the Special Districts Association are part of the uh, group that helps us to develop our strategies. We also have business leaders, regional nonprofit CEOs, regional philanthropic leaders, and labor education environmental leaders who all serve as a part of our governing arm. So as you could uh, think about it, that's really a reflection of leaders and decision makers uh, across the spectrum. We market the East Bay as a region of the Bay Area and highlight our businesses and quality of life assets to attract and retain businesses, which is really one of our fundamental purposes for existing. 
We advocate for legislation, policies, and funds that benefit businesses and growth in the workforce. We highlight best practices, business practices that promote education that leads to quality jobs, especially in the STEM education area. And we conduct and commission region-specific research, forecast, and data that help in planning and decision-making that moves our region forward. One of our signature pieces of research is our annual East Bay Economic Outlook, which you will receive as you leave here today. We are led by eight leadership committees that direct the work of our team and who lend their resources and expertise to this organization. We focus on informing small business about resource incentives and access to capital. We provide direct services and assistance to our member cities to help them with their economic development plans and growth. We work with educators to create unique and effective programs that help people obtain skills and knowledge to qualify for well-paying jobs. We promote our region for foreign investment and trade and introduce companies to opportunities abroad as well. We look at ways to improve the transport of goods and services and the infrastructure that is necessary for our businesses and our residents. We advocate for policies, funding, and legislation to improve economic development. And we market the region and communicate our success by our various platforms. And we make sure that our opportunities for all of our members are on all levels to get involved. In fact, we even have five current mayors who serve on our leadership council. And now I want to look at just a small sampling of some of our accomplishments. First, I'd like to welcome the new members who have joined us in the past 12 months. Let's welcome our new members to East Bay EDA and those who are present, would you please stand? The individuals who are standing have already become very active in the organization, and they've already involved themselves in taking on a leadership role. A few, a few weeks ago, many of our members were engaged with 300 high school students from Richmond, Berkeley, Emeryville, and Oakland, introducing them to careers in STEM and companies who are looking for local employees. This annual STEM Career Awareness Day will be followed with another similar event in Hayward this year. And I'd like to be, say a big thank you to uh, Rich Robbins and those that uh, are at Wareham, uh, because he has been one of the primary funders for that. And uh, him and along with Bayer have really uh, made this a signature event as well. Tomorrow, our Employees Advisory Committee will be hosting Congresswoman Barbara Lee and Congressman Mark DeSanye at a celebration for unveiling the East Bay's Congressional 2.0 Regional STEM Action Plan, a plan our committee created at the request of three congressional representatives to outline ways in which business, government, and nonprofits can work together to advance STEM education. This is the first such plan in the nation and it's, it involves high-level stakeholders discussion, discussing uh, 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 important issues that really were put out by the White House on last year. In November last year, we hosted our first International Consulate General uh, Showcase with a luncheon that we hosted. It had a, a number of people who showcased the in, international trade and investment in the East Bay it also introduced businesses to resources to help them grow their services and markets abroad. It was met with such great response that we had over 20 council generals attend, that, that our uh, International Trade and Investment Committee had expanded to even have a full day of summit coming up this year as a result of having such broad participation on the part of the council of generals. We also had a partnership with Cal Asian Chamber of Commerce, so I'm asking you already to mark your calendars and save the date for October the 26th. You'll get more information for that about that event 
as it comes forward. And I want to say a big thank you to the committee chair of the International Committee, John, uh, Jim, uh, James uh, Falaski, for all the work that he did uh, hosting the first uh, Council of General luncheon and preparing us for the all-day summit. In January, we hosted a private reception for our members with the legislative staff as well as our leaders. This was followed up by the East Bay Advocacy Day in February, where we partnered with the East Bay Leadership Council and the Innovation Tri-Valley Leadership Group and brought our leaders to Sacramento to meet with 10 of our legislators and to share their thoughts, their concerns, and to promote and lobby for legislation. Transportation was a primary topic of conversation, and we were pleased that SB1 passed. Now we have to continue that discussion as it relates to housing, and I know we'll hear more about housing today in the economic forecast. But I also want to recognize and thank the leader of the Legislative Committee, uh, Ed Del Bacaro. We started the conversation with the Federal Economic Development Agency on the needs for resources to conduct SEDS report to our cities and our region so that they can qualify for federal financing for projects that advance our economic development. This has evolved into a larger nine county seed study that is being done by ABAG, the Associated Bay Area Government. But true to our vision and recommendation, ABAG has adopted the structure of a regional strategy committee to provide input and outsight. And we have 13 leaders from within East Bay EDA that are involved in the East Bay Strategy Committee for this report that will be rolled out at our fall membership meeting, which will be held on September the 14th. So I also ask you to pin that date as well so that you can attend that event uh, also. And many of you attended uh, one of our signature events along with our 450 other guests, our fifth annual 2017 East Bay Innovations Award, where we marketed the, acts, the assets, assets of the East Bay that make doing business here the right choice, and celebrated the best innovative companies and organizations of our region. You may be able to go online and download some of the recipients that uh, received the award, not only this year, but in the past, and so I would encourage you to do so. For those of you who couldn't attend, copies of our East Bay Business Times insert are available at the reception desk outside and also on our website. Read about how our 2017 winners and finalists have found our region to be beneficial for the growth and well-being of their workforce. And you can see and go to our website to learn more about the 2018 nomination process for next year's winners and read the testimonials from our former winners to see how the awards have impacted them. If you haven't attended, uh, this has been a big signature event, almost like the Academy Awards, so I would encourage you to look at it next year. And we could not do this again without the incredible team, our staff, putting the hard work into the work that they do each and every day. Uh, I want to thank you again for attending uh, today's spring membership meeting. Uh, I ask that if you haven't gotten involved in East Bay EDA that you would uh, uh, consider getting very active in this organization that benefits not only you personally but the organizations and the businesses that you represent and our community as a whole. So that concludes our highlights and so please contact any of the East Bay EDA team get involved with the work that we do and join our dynamic organization. To learn more about East Bay EDA, visit our Twitter handle and like us on Facebook. Again, as you get inspired throughout this morning, tweet out the so to social media the messages that you are learning today and that you are picking up on today. And now it is my pleasure to introduce one of our fellow East Bay EDA executive colleagues, Emily Shanks. Emily Shanks serves as the regional executive over small business banking of the western region of the nation for Bank of America. Emily has been a longtime champion for small business and Bank of America's sponsorship to this event, enabling all of you to attend at no charge and, and, and to receive their support as we move towards research that shows the data and the study trends, which are very important to sound business planning and strategic growth. 
please help me to welcome Emily Shanks. Thank you, Supervisor Carson. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here with you today. I always look forward to this event and to hear what Dr. Thornbrook has to say. So Bank of America really is proud to be the sponsor of this event again this year and to invest in the Outlook report. We value the power of research and the data, business planning, uh, the data around business planning and business prospecting. For our business clients in this region, Knowing the state of the East Bay economy, the trends that affect the customers and, and their spending, and the future forecast can be the difference between a business success and a struggling company. We are very fortunate to benefit from this presentation from an economist, Dr. Christopher Thornburg of Beacon Economics. As Supervisor Carson mentioned, a hard copy of the East Bay Economic Outlook report will be available to you after this presentation when you leave. It is also available on the website, um, East Bay EDA. This is a, I will tell you, this is a report that I look at regularly throughout the year, and I also share it period, often with people that I come and interact with. It is, it is definitely valuable, and I hope, you, I hope you all enjoy it throughout the year, as I do. You all have a copy of Dr. Thornbird's bio, biography in your packets, but let me point out some of the highlights. East Bay EDA has worked with Dr. Thornburg since his early years at UCLA Anderson Forecast, where he was served as a senior analyst. His experience in conducting research and analysis for global clients also makes him an ideal eco economist for the East Bay, with our high degree of international trade and investment. Not only will you find the East Bay Economic Outlook Report an easy and organized read, you will find Dr. Thornburg's remarks to be very clear and easily understood through the volume of though volumes of research and data are behind this presentation. The other thing that comes to mind when I think of Dr. Thornburg's presentation is when he speaks, people listen. Because what he has to say is valuable and he says it in a way that actually resonates with all of us. So thank you for doing that in such a great way. If you have any questions for Dr. Thornburg, a question and answer time will follow and uh, will be conducted by my fellow East Bay EDA Economic Committee member, S Supervisor Candace Anderson. You have been provided with question cards in, in your seats, so we will, we will collect those periodically throughout the event, and uh, we'll get to as many questions as the time will allow. So please, help me welcome Dr. Thornburg. Thank you so much. I do not saw, there it is. Well done, good morning. Good morning. It is um, always wonderful to be back. I uh, can't even believe how many years I've been coming up here to do this talk on an annual basis. Always one of my um, most enjoyable events because of all the good friends I have here in the region. And, and that only is growing over time with all the other work we're doing up here nowadays. Um, but of course, um, with all the niceties aside, there's a lot to talk about today. Um, and I'm going to start with, uh, I think, uh, a, a, a little bit of a background about, about what I do for a living. You know, I, I like to say I'm a, I'm a forecaster. Uh, and with that in mind, what I do for a living is try to give you some sense of what's coming down the road. Now, when you're forecasting, there are, and by the way, we're going to have these slides available for people. So if you're looking for slides, we'll have these posted for folks. Uh, when I do Forecasting, I, I have to think of drivers of the economy. And, and there's a couple basic drivers we deal with. One are the trends. What's happening right now is very important because momentum is a powerful force in, in terms of what's going to be happening over, over the next year. And so trends we have to focus on, we have to think about. But the trends by themselves are not good enough. You also have to consider the fundamentals. For those of you uh, who may have remembered, I sort of made a name for myself back in 2005, 2006, screaming end of the world. Despite the fact that we saw very strong trends, the fundamentals were rotten. And unfortunately, my fears about the economy were justified in terms of what happened in 2008 and 2009. And then last but not least, there's this third factor, which are policies. And policies uh, can be local policies, that could be state policies, 
and they can be national policies. Um, now, sometimes I'll, I'll refer to here and there some policies, but it has not been a primary focus of my presentation, particularly over the last five or six years I've been doing this, in large part because policy has been pretty steady. And as such, changes in policy, because they weren't occurring, weren't really factoring into what's going to happen to the economy next. And then, of course, uh, November 8th happened. <laughs> and as we know, we have a new administration. Uh, we now have a, a supposedly Republican unified government. Um, and the idea that policy is going to be consistent the way it was, say, under the last six or seven years of the Obama administration, clearly uh, that particular view is out the window. Now, uh, people have asked me ever since, um, you know, what does this mean? The election of Trump mean for the economy? Uh, and I will, I will tell you what has been in my head since November 9th. The election of Donald Trump to the White House uh, has dramatically changed our forecast for the economy. We're just not sure how yet. <laughs> Which is, honest to God, that is the truth. Because clearly we have to think about policies and policy changes, but there is, at best, massive policy uncertainty under this current administration. A uh, lot of, uh, shall we say, big ideas, tremendous ideas, bigly tremendous ideas <laughs> uh, with almost no detail. And of course, as we've seen, the reality of politics in DC versus the amateur who occupies the White House, and he is an amateur politician, and that's not an insult, that's just the reality of the situation. Um, and of course, here we are past 100 days, and candidly, the uncertainty today is bigger than it was on November 9th. Now, in many ways, I'm going to focus on trends. I'm going to be focusing on some of the fundamentals, since that's going to tell you best what's going to happen over the next year. But the policy concepts, the policy things that are going to be happening, a little bit unclear. And clearly, the range of potential policy outcomes can be um, positive or negative, as the case may be. And I'm only going to touch on a few elements of policy today, given the hour I have with you. So we can't go too deep in things, but I'm going to try and pick some highlights uh, but I do want to, you know, kind of give a little bit of a background for where we ended up. Uh, if you remember last year, one of my watchwords was miserableism, right? Uh, and in, in many ways, uh, I was talking about how we have this incredibly negative view of an economy that doesn't match up with the reality of our economy, this, this miserableism. And, and the, the election had really devolved into uh, really two competing miserableism voices. Uh, there was um, uh, obviously Donald Trump on the right with the Make America Great nonsense. Uh, and then, of course, we had Bernie Sanders on the left, who, for those of you who may have been feeling the burn, uh, candidly, his views of the economy were roughly the same as Trump. He painted a picture of an economy going in absolutely the wrong direction in all sorts of different ways, and we needed a mass orchard. And, of course, you had Clinton caught in the middle. And in many ways, it was that position in the middle between the miserablest and the right and the miserablest left that I, I personally think ultimately led uh, to her, her, her loss in this particular election. Um, so in many ways, I call this victory the, the, the victory of miserableism, of painting a picture of our economy that wasn't true. It's just not true. And you know, I like to say one of the biggest fears of, of this new administration is the basic idea that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Because honestly, the economy's doing pretty well. Uh, we're growing, we're growing at two to two and a half percent, not as good as a three and a half percent, but there's some really logical reasons for why that's occurring, which we're gonna come to in a few minutes. More importantly, I always talk about the fundamentals. Fundamentals are fine. Who's heard this? Um, well, you know, we're in the seventh year of this current economic expansion. And that means any day now, we're gonna have another recession. And there's this idea, you know, it's just, there's this picture, uh, in, in, and I guess this is whoever is saying this out loud, that, it, that a, 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 an, an expansion, an economic expansion is kind of like a, a lifespan of a human, you know? We're born, we're young and robust, and, and then a little later on, we make up for a little lack of our, our say, physical strength by being smart, um, and then we start smelling funny, we get crotchety, and we die. <laughs> uh, doesn't work like that, okay? 
every single expansion is permanent until it is ended by some negative shock to the system. Predicting a recession is a function of predicting what that shock will be, where that shock will come from. <laughs> if you don't have a shock, we're not gonna have a recession. And there's plenty of economies that prove that. I think Australia right now is something on the order in their 19th year of their current economic expansion. There are economies that have avoided recessions completely. So just because we're near you know, seven years or eight years doesn't mean anything. The fundamentals are fine. There's no reason for our economy uh, to slow down any time in the near future. Are we suffering? I, I, my favorite statistic, the US, 5% of the world's population, 20% of global consumption. We are the biggest group of spoiled brats on the planet. I would love to hear a presidential candidate point that out to us once. Real incomes have been rising, true well-being even more so. Labor markets are tight. One of the ongoing incredible myths of this election is the myth of the terrible American labor market. A place where across the Midwest there are, are vast herds of blue collar workers like the Buffalo of yesteryear desperately searching for a manufacturing job. This is an image we've created of our economy that is totally false. Today, labor markets are very tight. Inflation's still low. In interest rates are still low. Business investment is solid. Corporate profits are very high. US energy sector, too successful for its own good. Manufacturing, doing just fine. Thank you very much. Exports have been very good for the US economy, which we often forget about. Housing, there's signs of progress in our fair state of California, still way out in front, pushing the US, eco US economy forward, not holding the back. Plenty of good things happening. Now, it isn't to say there aren't problems. Unfortunately, the problems that we have were not the problems that were the focus of this particular election. And again, this disconnect is what worries me so much. For example, some of the slow growth we're dealing with is due to self-inflicted wounds, this preposterous partisan gridlock, where somehow or other the, the far elements of the left and the right who won't talk to each other have decided the word compromise is a dirty word, and we can't accomplish even basic things. Uh, we went through the global commodity glut last year, which was the, one of the reasons we had a little bit of a slowdown. State and local budgets are still stressed. We are see, we've seen seven years of revenue expansion, and I talk to cities across this state, and every city's feeling as strapped now as they did six years ago. There's an issue here. We're going to come to that. Uh, health cost inflation, underfunded pensions entitlements. We got to the issue. Um, underperforming housing market, growing wealth in economy, shift to the information economy. All these things are the true issues, and yet instead of focusing on real problems and dealing with the real problems, we have instead devolved into creating fake problems and offering solutions for these false problems. That's no way to run a ship, folks. And, and that, for me, is the biggest worry of all. The fact that we don't seem to be able to focus on true issues, instead, we create false issues. And my goal in a lot of these conversations is to try and get this across, to try to get people to think about what the real issues are. Let's put aside the shrieking headlines on the network news and really try to focus on what these real issues are. So optimism in the short run. Now take uh, GDP. First week, first quarter, so what? We've had a weak first quarter every, every year for the last six years, basically. First quarters tend to be weak. It's a function of the fact that Christmases are getting better and better, and our Christmas hangover is getting worse and worse, and this year was no exception. Uh, we said about a 0.7% growth rate, but overall our economy is actually in acceleration mode at this particular point in time, despite that very weak first quarter. On the left-hand side here, this is real GDP growth. I do a year-on-year -year basis. It gets rid of some of the short-run volatility. And you can see we kind of heat up. We slow down, heat up, slow down. This last time, we, we kind of peaked out in terms of growth towards the end of 2014, and then we slowed down. Global commodity glut, saw a big decline in commodity prices, big pack, uh, pullback in oil exploration, a, a slowdown in export growth. We, we talked about this last year. Well, that's starting to fade. And indeed, in the first quarter, one of the best signs for an economy that's accelerating is the fact that business investment has really started to bounce back. All the weakness in the first quarter was consumer spending after really a great year of consumer spending all the way through 2016. 
And of course, you can see the numbers here, industrial production growth after weakening to about negative 3%, most of that again on the mining side, is now back into positive territory. The ISM indices moving forward nicely. Everything suggests that the current production side of our economy, it's done the slowdown, is now starting to bounce back. Very good signs. As for the consumer themselves, again, kind of a blip more than anything else. You look at the numbers, after pretty strong growth this year, real spending sort of flattened out just a little bit. Still growing about 2.5, 2.6%, which is a good steady number at this particular point in time. If you break it down, a little bit of a slowdown, most everything, the only thing that kind of stands out in terms of the consumer spending slowdown is indeed the auto sector. Autos are, got, the market got a little ahead of itself. Uh, overall auto demand seems a little weaker than it used to be. Millennials don't want to drive as much. You got Uber and Lyft out there. We know there's a ton of used cars on the market. Boy, if you're looking for a good deal on a car, all these leases are flowing back in and there's just crazy good deals on this kind of stuff. I think autos aren't going to pull back, but they've kind of peaked out just a little bit. Uh, but overall, again, this just shows kind of a general slowdown. And it's not because people are suffering. Indeed, if you look at the overall numbers, the financial obligation ratio is still in a record low level. And probably the best indicator of all, I look at the savings rate. Because you can see we've been kind of ticking wrong in this 5.9% range. Fourth quarter, a big surge in spending. Savings rates drop. First quarter came and savings are bouncing back just a little bit. People are putting it back in the bank, catching up just a little bit. Nothing to see here, folks. Overall, the rest of the year is going to be very good for consumer spending. And consumers are happy because they have lots of work. It goes back to this idea of, of a strong labor market. We have one week month, March. The other three months were 200K. Overall, we're running, uh, oh, I don't know, about 170,000, 180,000 jobs a month, which is pretty solid. Overall, that's about a 1.7% growth rate. Um, now, compared to, say, 2014, it's a little lower, but we also have to remember that that's not a function of slowing of labor demand. In fact, if you look at the job openings rate, still near a record high level. Uh, certain sectors in particular, still lots of labor demand. Healthcare professional services, top two in terms of job openings right now uh, in the U.S. economy. Very solid numbers there. Unemployment rate. Uh, the headline number are below 5%. That's a very tight labor market. The expanded version, which includes, of course, discouraged workers, continues to fall down to about 9%. Uh, wages are growing. Median wages for people with high school or less and a bachelor's degree and more, all growing at a little less than 4% at this particular point in time. So you can see how the compression in the labor market is finally handing some of the gains back to the workers. This is all good stuff. The labor force is starting to grow a little bit faster, growing about 1.2%, best numbers we've seen since 2005. Even the number of people on Social Security disability, which is the new version of welfare, you know, welfare reform got rid of the old version of welfare back in the 90s. The new form of welfare is, is, is Social Security disability. Um, and enrollment and disability actually went down in 2016, substantially. People are moving back into the labor markets. This is all a sign of a healthy economy. And yes, that's true everywhere. Here is, this is one of my, again, one of these ongoing myths of our economy. Well, why did Wisconsin go for Trump? Everybody was surprised about that. Clinton administration was shocked about that. And I talked to some people from Wisconsin. That's because the Wisconsin economy is doing terrible. Manufacturing, China, ruining their economy. How bad is it? Well, in November of 2016, the Wisconsin unemployment rate was 4.1%. <laughs> one of the lowest in the nation. Well, that's because of all the discouraged workers. Actually, the participation rate in Wisconsin was 68%, one of the highest in the nation. In fact, the labor market in Wisconsin's one of the tightest labor markets in the country right now. So why are they so unhappy? Because they live in Wisconsin. <laughs> now, actually, I know, that sounds insulting. Maybe a little, you know. Uh, but putting that to one side, I mean, there is a functional issue here. Now that the U.S. economy is, is healed, some of the traditional patterns of migration are reappearing, which is to say people are getting the hell out of Wisconsin <laughs> and other places in the Midwest and the Northeast. They're tired of the winters. They don't want to deal with it anymore. They're moving south. They're moving west. And in many ways, one of the issues in Wisconsin is they don't feel like they're growing, and they're not because people are leaving. I mean, that is one of the functional issues there. In places like Florida, Nevada, Colorado, Oregon, this is where people are moving. 
They're getting out, they're going different places, and those places they feel like things are bad, but again, it's bad because things are good, if that makes any sense. And that's really what's driving the show at this particular point in time. Even this idea of income stagnation, you know, you heard this, you know, uh, we have, Americans haven't had a raise in 15 years. In fact, this is one of my, my, my favorite graphs because it is so prevalent on the internet. You will find 5,000 web page with this specific graph, and this is data you can grab directly, directly off the census web page. This is real mean household incomes. You can get the median household income. It's exactly the same picture, and it shows this picture. The incomes, they were basically flat back in, you know, I'm sorry, back in the early 80s when things were bad, but then ever since then, nice rise, 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 and they peaked in 2000, and ever since then, been moving sideways. American families haven't gotten a raise in 15 years. Now, the reason 5,000 web pages have this is they're divided equally. There are 2,500 left-wing websites that will tell you that this terrible thing is occurring because of evil corporations and evil rich people screwing the middle class. And then the other 2,500 websites are right-wing websites, and they will tell you it's because of bad taxes and bad rules that are screwing the middle class. I have the real explanation. The data's wrong. Ah, read the fine print. What does this data come from? Where does this data come from? It comes from people's adjusted gross income on their IRS form. Ah, that's very telling because guess what? There's all sorts of income that does not show up on your adjusted gross income number on your IRS form. Take, for example, pension payments. Whether you're doing it yourself in a 401k or a SEP, or your employer is doing it for you, none of those show up on here. Healthcare, which you get from your employer or the government, doesn't show up on here. Social Security doesn't show up on here. I can go through a litany of forms of income that do not show up on here. And by the way, those sources of income have been growing for any number of reasons. Now, we have another data set on this. It comes from the Bureau of Economic Analysis. We don't like it very much because it doesn't allow us to break it out among households. It's not good like that. But it's important because it does at least give us an aggregate number, and I can divide it by the number of households to come up with an actual real mean income, and it looks like that. Oops, things aren't so bad. In fact, they grew all the way through 2007, went sideways, and in 2015, they reached an all-time high level. This is the reality of Americans. Yes, our lifestyles continue to improve, and that is true for lots of different people at lots of different levels. And even here, we're missing it. I mean, it's amazing to me that we buy into this idea that these incomes have been flat. Does that even feel right? Who's heard this? Millennials, we the first generation to have a worse standard of living than their parents. Just, just stop for a second. Just, just stop. We all see that in the news. But just think, really? Does anybody in this room really think that millennials are going to have a worse standard of living than us? That is the most preposterous thing I have ever heard in my entire life. And in so many ways, the lives of millennials are so much better than what I had when I was of that age. That I can't even get it. Do I have any millennials here? There you go. I got a couple, all right? I got a few things to explain to you, OK? <laughs> so let, let me start. I'm going to start with this. What is better today than 30 years ago? Okay, what is better for you than it was for me 30 years ago? I'm going to start with uh, communication. So you, you might have heard, I have a one-year-old at home now. Last year he was not even that. He's, you know, he's like 13 months or so. Uh, he's now huge, and he's a thug, and he's just like me, in other words. Um, <laughs> but, you know, his grandma's in Japan. Now, 30 years ago, if grandma was in Japan, besides the occasional letter, let's say she wanted to find out how her grandkid was doing, she'd make a phone call. And it'd be like, hey, how's he doing? He's alive, great, love you, click, $30. <laughs> Today, I have an iPad. Mom, grandma has an iPad. And we set it up, and she plays with her grandson for an hour for free. None of that shows up in there. 
None of that. Uh, medical care. Now forget the cost. Let's just think about medical care. When I was a kid, a knee replacement surgery, you were in the hospital for a week. It was a nightmare. Today, it's like, boom, get out of here. Woo! <laughs> tape. We need Scott's tape. <laughs> Wow, there's another battery somewhere. Man, I get so excited, don't I? All right, anyway. That was interesting. All right, you gotta hang on to the thing, all right. And just think of everything that's available today from medical perspective, pharmaceutical perspective, it's amazing. Entertainment options. When I was a kid, I had four television channels, four. And that was only if I had the funny antenna so I could get PBS, okay? That was it, four. Uh, transportation, cars, oh my God, it's amazing how good things are today. Shopping, product quality. When I, I have big feet, someone said, pointed that out to me today. They're like, hey, you got big feet, how big are those things? They're gigantic. When I was a kid, finding shoes, nightmare. I'd walk in, hey, do you have 14 wide? No. <laughs> Today I go on Amazon, I click 14 wide, they give me 7,000 pairs I can possibly buy. It's amazing. There's no more hunting and seeking, it's there. Um, food quality, variety. When I was a kid, you got strawberries six weeks a year, that's it. Nowadays we complain in November, oh, these strawberries look lousy. Really? Uh, access to information, the internet, like ever before. Environmental conditions, how much cleaner is the air than we used to be? Legal marijuana, <laughs> enough said. <laughs> Millennials, you have no idea how good you have it. There's only one thing, there's only one thing that's worse today than it was 30 years ago, the stones. Everything else is better. <laughs> Everything else is better. Stop whining. Uh, what about the participation rate? Every millennial goes here. Well, I'm sorry, every, not millennial, miserable list goes here. Well, it's all about the participation rate. What do you mean by that? Used to be the participation rate was 67%. Nowadays, it's 63%. Clearly, our economy is going to hell in a handbasket. Well, again, this is very true. The data is very real. And it was predicted in 1990. This is demographics. Simple as that. We have an aging workforce where participation rates naturally fall. That's what's driving this particular figure. Now there is churn, there is churn. We played a little game. It was, it was actually fascinating because everybody assumes the economy was stronger, there'd be more people in the labor market. And we all look back to 2000 as that period of time where things were just so good. But well, we played a game, we took participation rates in 2000, and we, importantly, we're broken down by age and education and, and gender, and we applied it to the adult population in 2015, most recent data. And what's amazing is, when you do that, the labor force doesn't get larger. It gets smaller. It gets smaller, a million people smaller. Now in the midst of that is a big churn. Are there blue collar workers on the outside looking in? Yes, there are. About two million plus. Now it's about 1% of the adult population, it's not the defining element, but there are, yes, younger blue collar workers are not participating, a lot of them are on the outside looking in, and there's a problem there. There's something we have to deal with. Those people need some help, no doubt about it. But on the other side, we got three and a half million people working who wouldn't have been back in 2000. And who are these people? Older blue collar workers, educated workers, and most of all, female workers who are participating like everyone before. So I like to say, our jobs have not been stolen by the Chinese and the Mexicans, they've been stolen by women. <laughs> Just keep it in mind. Even secular stagnation, right? This whole idea, you may hear it go on and on and on. Secular stagnation, we used to grow at 3.5%, now we're growing at 2%. 2 Clearly something's terribly wrong, and it all happened around 2000. Well, some of this is optics. One of the reasons you're not seeing this right is because we don't acknowledge the fact that the late 90s and the middle part of last decade were bubbles, where we were growing faster than was actually reasonable. Indeed, things started to slow down around 1995. That's when you started to see this general slowdown in GDP growth. Why? The simplest of all reasons. 
You know, we all talk about regulations, we all talk about taxes and distortions in the market and too many big companies and la, ma, 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 ma. Much simpler. This is the number of growth in the adult population of the U.S. economy. And up to about 1995, it was regularly growing 1.5% to 2% per year. And then because of the aging of the workforce, things have slowed down. And of course, over the last few years, slowed down tremendously, where the adult population is not even growing at 0.6%. Overall population growth, growth of the workforce, is half of GDP growth. This is what's causing the slowdown. Simple as that. Now, is there a solution for this problem? Well, yes, two things. More sex, <laughs> get busy, and more immigrants. And that, to me, I think is one of the things this administration has totally wrong. Immigration. Immigration is not a problem. Immigration is a solution. Right now, half of population growth comes from, from immigration. In 20 years, because of the decline in birth rates, it's going to be two-thirds. We have a full labor market with 11 million undocumented people in this nation. And yet, this entire conversation in Washington, D.C. is about how immigrants are somehow or other bad for our economy. Well, folks, that's totally out of line. There's no reality in that statement. And of course, their efforts to pull back on immigration, whether it's undocumented or documented, whether it's H-1B visas or having more aggressive ICE actions, that's going to hurt our state, particularly, because our state is a land of immigrants. 27% of Californians were born overseas. Compare that to places like Wisconsin, where it's 4%. And even those 4% are like, how the hell did we end up here? <laughs> This is, we're, we're going the wrong way. Simple as that. Uh, how about California, you know, 50th worst place to do business in the nation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, last five years, eighth fastest growing economy. One out of six jobs in the nation produced here in California. A little bit of a slowdown payroll growth recently, but that just ma uh, is mimicking what's happening at the greater U.S. level. Very solid numbers across the board. Uh, 25 years are greater than average growth, unemployment rate back down the U.S. levels. California's current share of national personal income never been higher than it is right now. What kind of jobs? I always love this. And again, every, I'm the miserablest out there. Well, sure, California has a lot of jobs, but they're bad jobs. <laughs> no, I don't even know what that means. And I, and I hate that kind of aspersion. I, 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 someone was, was yelling about, about, you know, oh, half of the jobs are in these low-paid sectors. Well, just because there are a lot of jobs in low-paid sectors doesn't mean incomes aren't going up. You, because there are high-paid jobs even in low-income sectors, and you don't know what kind of people or jobs people are taking. You, you, we don't have to have this speculative game. We have data for the American Community Survey. That's on the right-hand side. This is change in, in employment, full-time employment in the state, from 2011 to 2015, the most recent data. And by far and away, the biggest number of new earners in the state is in the 100K plus club, 400,000. Number two is in the 25 to 50K range of 300,000, and then a little smattering. So a little bit of, no, no doubt, a little bit of barbell here because we have a lot of low-skilled people. But these are good numbers. I'll take the 100K and the 25 to 50K club. There's nothing wrong with this. These are good numbers for the state. Um, ta taxable sales continue to grow, non-residential permits, Slowing down a little bit, but at a plateau above where they were in 07. GDP in the state continues to grow faster than the national. So many good things. And then what, where is the growth? Well, here is where I think things start to get really interesting, particularly when we start talking about the East Bay. Look, I remember, you know, I was up here after the big tech bust and things were rough and things got heated up a little bit. And then the East Bay, of course, got hammered by the big housing crash, and everything slowed down, and the place was kind of struggling to get going, struggling to get going. And then last couple of years, you know, I've come up here, and my primary message was, it's great. And don't worry, because so far, so good. Things are relatively sustainable. But this year, we've even gone to the next step. This year, it's no longer you're playing catch up with the West Bay. This year, the East Bay is the it economy in the Bay Area. Look what's happening right now. 
East Bay, uh, the East Bay, 2.8% growth, a little bit of a slowing from last year. But then again, look what happened in San Francisco, 4.5% to 2.5. San Jose, 3.3 down to 2.0. Some of this has to do with a pullback in tech, a little bit, they got a little ahead of themselves, some venture capital money. But another big part of it is the fact that it's simply too expensive. And as a result of that, businesses are naturally moving to lower cost place. And you can see a bit of a slowdown. Here's San Francisco on the left-hand side here, slowdown in manufacturing, slowdown, big slowdown in information, slowdown in professionals, slowdown in management, slowdown in admin, slowdown in leisure and hospitality. San Jose, very similar. Uh, slowdown in well, construction, manufacturing, slowdown, a little bit of slowdown in retail, big slowdown in finance, and of course, admin support. But then you look here in the East Bay, the only slowing sectors, yes, a little bit of the manufacturing front, that's the export issues that have been going on, a little bit of slowdown in retail trade, a little bit of slowdown in information, but then you got a big surge in new professional service jobs, 3.8% to 6.4, financial activities, 2.5 to 6.0, and of course, wholesale trade, the logistics sector, 2.3 to 5.2. Stellar sectors really starting to move forward strongly. A lot of very powerful trends. As for where the growth is occurring, you start to see it again moving out. Alameda recovered before Contra Costa. Overall, Alameda is about 9.7% above where it was back uh, pre-recession. They've grown about 3% over the last year. Contra Costa is only about 4.5% above the previous peak, but they've grown 3.5% over the course of the last year. So again, you see all this growth in these jobs starting to move east and into the northeast part of the things. Things are shifting pretty tremendously. Uh, airports are is doing great. It was packed there this morning. Uh, hotels are busy. That's going really well. Uh, taxable sales have flattened out in San Francisco and San Jose, but they continue to grow in the East Bay right now. And of course, big numbers, autos, uh, construction is way up. Restaurants and hotels are way up. Those are some of the big stellar growth sectors, as the case may be. Ports are uh, it's going a little sideways. It's been you know, a pretty so-so year in terms of overall trade. You do see a little bit of a decline in imports, but exports are starting to pick up after uh, a weak year. Uh, Port of Richmond just kind of moving steady out over to the side. As for some of the important sectors, uh, take a look at information. So information has definitely gone flat. A lot of software publishers, we know there's been a pullback, got a little ahead of themselves, been some hits there and there. Um, there's been basically, they've gone flat in uh, San Jose. They've come down a little bit in San Francisco. The East Bay still seeing a little bit of growth. And of course, some important numbers for the East Bay, software publishers, big growth there, 70% increase. Uh, you got data processing, hosting related services, huge increase, 4,600 jobs there. Other information also up strongly. A lot of those information jobs are moving across. We see the demand in the local office space. On the professional and tech side, again, it is, it is not, if you will, accounting or in law firms. You got computer system design related scientific research, architectural engineering services moving in. And yet, you got some lawyers, too. They're down there at the bottom, 11% growth in that particular front. We all need lawyers, folks. We don't need lawyers until we need a lawyer. Um, as for venture capital, the numbers are very good. Uh, a nice growth in, in 2016 relative to 2015. Uh, across the board, about 27% increase. Biotech has come back. Electronic instrumentation coming back. Semiconductors coming back. Solid numbers there. Uh, a variety by different stages. We have a uh, new database we've been playing with recently called uh, that we've, we're having fun with. And these are some of the numbers coming out of there, different levels at this particular point in time. So nice venture capital flowing into the region. On the manufacturing side, manufacturing in, in most of the US and right here in the East Bay continues to side. But don't forget that, don't confuse inputs and outputs. The manufacturing sector is doing, doing well, but they do so with information technology, they do so with, uh, with automation, things like that. Where you are seeing some growth in manufacturing, again, electronic instrument and medical equipment. Some of the more uh, old school stuff like petroleum and coal products is down, uh, food is down, but you see these, these new sort of tech-esque sectors continuing to rise. So many good trends in these important driving industries for the local economy. Uh, commercial real estate numbers look pretty good. Nice bounce in overall spending activity last year um, uh, compared to some other parts of the Bay. Uh, offices are doing good. Office vacancy rates continue to drift down, particularly in the North Alameda market at this particular point in nine, and, and the North I-680, uh, some of the big store office markets there. You see a little bump in office construction for the first time in a while. Not as strong as uh, back in, you know, 07, 06, but solid numbers. You get more investment happening here in response to this. 
Retail has been bouncing back nicely in terms of construction permits uh, in different parts of the market as well. Now, mind you, this is some specialty retail. There's a big shift going on in the retail sector right now. And of course, you have uh, warehouse uh, and uh, uh, flex R&D sectors also doing very well at this particular point in time. All signs, again, of an economy that's really moving forward strongly at this particular time. And it, just to give you some sense of the cost advantages, look at the right-hand side. This is flex R&D cost to rent. Look how affordable the East Bay is compared to San Francisco and San Jose. I mean, there's no reason they're coming. There's a reason they're coming here. It makes sense. It just makes sense for, for a bottom line. And here's some of the downside. Oakland in particular, some of the lowest numbers. Union City, Hayward seeing some solid numbers there. And of course, Fremont, as always, uh, starting, to, uh, starting to bounce back as well. Um, now, of course, there's a whole other side to the East Bay. That's all the business side. There's also the household side. Remember, there's a difference between payroll employment, which is by where you work, versus household employment, which is on the base of where you live. Uh, the East Bay has always been the biggest uh, home in terms of, of, of people with jobs. Uh, right now, for example, there's about one point, a little less than 1.35 million people employed residents of the East Bay. Compare that to just about uh, just a speck over a million in San Jose and a tiny bit less than a million in San Francisco. Uh, and again, breaking it down between Alameda and Contra Costa, Alameda running about 800,000, Contra Costa running just a little bit less than 550,000. Uh, growth in both markets. Unemployment right now is 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 about four percent in the East Bay. So many job opportunities right there. And in many ways, it's important to recognize that really the strength of the economy is helping lots of people. It really is a broad-based lift. Take, for example, the unemployment rate for people less than a high school degree. Still high at 8%, but down 2.6 percentage points over the course of the last couple of years. Some college, 5.2, which is down 4%, 4 percent, 4 percentage points from 2013 to 2015. This is a little dated because it's American Community Survey. It's unfortunately the most recent data. It's fantastic data, but just not that uh, current as the case may be. And even by age, again, you can see the under 25 crowd. Unemployment rates have fallen almost five percentage points over the course of last year. So even our youth are getting back to work. I, is there anything to complain about? Well, we'll get there. <laughs> um, commute patterns, of course, are still here. The, uh, uh, but you know, a lot of these folks who are living here are commuting to San Francisco. Uh, back in 2010, about 9.8% of residents uh, here in uh, East Bay, we're commuting to San Francisco. Now it's about 13%, a very large increase. And remember, that's on top of a lot more employed residents. As for the what I call the intra East Bay, East Bay, and then you have intra East Bay. That's the intra East Bay are people basically going back and forth between the two counties. That's been a big increase in right now. So within the East Bay, you're talking to still about uh, about 77% overall, which is a little lower than it was before. Uh, Santa Clara San, and uh, San Mateo roughly flat um, from this particular point in time. But again, all, lots of folks living here going across to, to San Francisco on a daily basis. Uh, in terms of incomes, this is a, a very similar breakdown to what I showed you for the states, the increase, and in, this is for full-time employment, biannual income, 100K plus club, by far and away, the biggest amount of new folks, 50 to 75 the next. And if you want to break it down a little bit by income levels, uh, again, this is income by level of, uh, by, for all workers, by level of education, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's, again, compared to five years ago, you know, sure, grads and bachelor degree are doing better, but the big growth rate is towards the bottom end, high schools and less than high school. Those are folks who are seeing more job opportunity. It's good to see the hospitality side of the industry booming. It's good to see these low unemployment rates because, of course, the fact it raises wages for everybody because there is a tough time getting good people. And I think everybody in this room understands that at this point in time. And you can see household income numbers up as well. Lots of good things happening over here. Now with that, have I given this quiz here before? OK, well, that's good. I have a quiz for you. I know, audience participation, it always sucks, right? <laughs> but I'm not going to make you clap or anything, so that's the good news. My quiz is this. Um, I have a matching quiz for you. You remember how matching quizzes back in elementary school? You got letters and numbers, you're going to match them up, right? On the left-hand side are growth rates in jobs from 1995 to 2015. And on the right side, I've broken the state into five regions, Bay Area, Central Coast, Greater LA, Greater Sacramento, and South Central Valley. Everybody got that? And the whole idea here is to match the letter with the number. OK, so I'm going to give you a couple seconds to think about this, think about this. 
And I said, I'm going to pick on you, because I like your tie. It's very <laughs> Tell me where the Bay Area is. Give me a letter. C. C. OK. I'm going to go for another vote here. Where's my millennial? She's back there. What do you think? Give, give, tell me where the Bay Area is. Tell me the letter. Um, I would guess D. D? Is that what you said? OK, D. You got a D and a C. All right, well, I'm just going to be the answer key, because I don't want to run out of time. Uh, these are lined up perfectly. <laughs> now, yes, your eyes do not deceive you. The South Central Valley, which is Fresno down to Imperial County, has been the fastest growing part of the California economy over the last 20 years. Then you have Greater Sacramento, then Cent Greater LA, and then Central Coast, and then last but not least, the Bay Area. Now, this is a shock to everybody's system, because as you know, the Bay Area, particularly the West Bay, has everything. They got the right clusters, they got the right money, they have the, the best and the brightest, they have hordes of Stanford grads who just think they're smarter than God. <laughs> they're not. That's a little, little bitterness there from a UCLA guy. Um, but you gotta remember, the growth in the long run, it, it's not about clusters, and it's not about incentives. <coughs> growth in the long run is about people. About people. And of course, when you start talking about people, you got to talk about housing. The reason the Bay Area is growing slower is because the Bay Area is the most resistant part of the state to building more housing. And yes, tech is rising, but because of the lack of housing, tech rises not at the support of the broader economy, but replacing the broader economy. And this is a very simple fact. There is a housing shortage. Now, uh, one of my guys found this. If there was a bridge fort shortage in California, how would we handle it? Well, we first point out that bakers are greedy and that government must own the bread. We'd probably talk about nonprofit baking or bread certainty. How about a minimum loaf size regulation? We have a government baker, a baking impact fee. How about stronger baking bread regulations, huh? I got a better idea. Why don't we just bake some more bread loaves of bread? Let's stop with the affordable housing crisis nonsense. This is not an affordable housing crisis. This is a housing supply crisis, which is having an impact on affordability. Sounds similar, but when you say those two things out loud, you end up with completely different subscriptions for the solution. Prescriptions for the solution, excuse me. If it's an affordable housing crisis, it's all about rent control and affordable housing mandates. If it's a housing shortage, you got to build more housing. And those are different. And you ask yourself, why are prices going through the roof? It's not a bubble. It's nowhere close to a bubble. 2005 was a bubble. How do I know? Vastly overborrowing. Crazy numbers in terms of what people were buying given the income they actually were earning. In the late, day, late 80s, we had a bubble, too. I wasn't around then, but I've studied the numbers. Back then, it wasn't about crazy borrowing. Back then, it was about crazy building. This time around, we don't have crazy borrowing. We don't have crazy building. This is driven by sheer supply and demand. Simple as that. If you look at the permits, they haven't responded. Huge housing demand, but look where we are. Multifamilies come back, but single family is still vastly below where it was. Overall, the state adding four people for each population. Here in the area, again, the numbers go up, up, up. Uh, Alameda County right now, getting into the 800 range. You got uh, Contra Costa up there as well, all more expensive than the state overall. Condos doing the same sort of thing, although they've leveled off just a little bit recently. Apartments continue to become more expensive, there's no doubt about it. A little tailing off at the very end there, a little pump in the vacancy rates. That all suggests that some stuff is coming on and it's creating a little bit of alleviation. But the economy's grown like gangbusters. Unemployment rates right now are 4%. The ability for the East Bay to continue to grow at a greater than normal level is going to critically depend on increasing the supply of new homes moving into the area. Um, well, what is happening? Better numbers, but I would say probably not good enough just yet. Overall residential construction permits still running about 2,000 right now per quarter, vastly too low. And of course, if you look at the numbers, single families come back just a little bit. Multifamily is kind of going sideways right now. A little bit more of this stuff needs to come online. So things are getting a little better, 
but still far behind and still there's going to be a lot more need for this stuff moving forward to maintain these current situation. And, and certainly you can see the, the disconnect right here, where overall you've added about, uh, about 10,000 new homes and you're only having about 8,000 permits. The shortage has been in place for years. The vacancy rate in 2015, most recent, was 4%. I'm sure it's tighter now. Same thing in Contra Costa, some of the lowest vacancy rates in the nation. Critically important to have more housing. Stop the affordable housing nonsense. It's housing. Not affordable housing, it's housing. And now, mind you, if you don't build it, will you grow? Sure. But to put this in context, I, I, had, a, I had a conversation with somebody the other day, and they were saying, well, you, you, you do a lot of work in, uh, in Orange County. Yeah, yeah, we do. Well, I, we need to learn more about Orange County. Why? Well, you know, they must have great development policies because, you know, the incomes are so high. And I said, well, that's like walking into the Bel Air Country Club and going, wow, you must have great training programs here because everybody's rich. Well, no, there's a barrier. It's called the cost of emission. They were rich before they walked in this door. People in coastal Orange County are rich because no one else can afford to live there. It's got a country club effect. You can grow without new housing, but you're going to deal with the churn, the gentrification, the fact that high-income people move in and low-income people are forced to move out. So this is a functional decision. Stop with the affordable housing and start talking about this. If you want to be East Bay for everybody, the answer is more housing. If you want to be East Bay for the wealthy, then do what you're doing now. And what's going to continue to happen is the rich are going to move here, and they're going to be displacing people. And you already see that. This is inbound, outbound migration. This is net migration. And you can see the numbers. Tons of people moving here from San Francisco, other parts of California, San Mateo, Santa Clara. They're moving to the East Bay. And then 27,000 people are moving out of state because they can't afford to live here anymore. And these are primarily more low-skilled people having to go someplace else. It's a decision we have to make. Last but not least, the Trump. And I know I'm running out of time. How much time do I got left? 10 minutes, perfect. Uh, I want to talk about two things when it comes to the Trump administration, two things that are on my mind right now, of course, health care and taxes. And we'll start with health care. The House did pass a version of Ryan Care. Um, now, what's in it? Even the Republicans aren't quite sure. <laughs> but they repealed Obamacare, and that's what it's all about. And mind you, whether this gets through the Senate, I don't know. Uh, actually, a colleague, an acquaintance of mine who works for Kaiser, was flying up here on the same plane this morning. I was chit-chatting with him. He's uh, high up in Kaiser in Southern California, obviously coming up here for the headquarters. And I said, what do you think? He said, I'll never get through the Senate. All hell's breaking loose. They're going to these, having these town halls. People are losing their minds. You start getting into the guts of this plan, and it is shocking what they're trying to back off on. And there's a functional reality here that Republicans are dealing with it. Well, and there, it has two parts. First part is, like it or not, there are 20 million more people who are insured today than pre-ACA. And to throw those 20 million people out is a political disaster. And of course, that doesn't even count the fact that for countless millions more, they've seen a substantial improvement in their health care that, again, pushing that down again is, is going to bring mess. The second thing the Republicans are rapidly learning is this. And I, I can't say I came up with this. Uh, I, I was fortunate enough to meet this person who's sort of a Washington, D.C. insider, and he had this, this really smart point, and I hadn't really thought about it before, but he said that, you know, we've all heard the, the term uh, hot potato, right? Well, healthcare is the radioactive potato, okay? <laughs> and you do not want to hold this potato. This thing is, it will kill you. And the Democrats learned that twice. They learned it under the Clinton administration, and they learned it under the Obama administration, how bad the healthcare issue is. And the Republicans are now own it, and they're figuring out how badly you do not want to own it. It's a great place to be yelling at the other person about, but to actually have to deal with this yourself is an absolute nightmare. And the reason for that, of course, is because the entire conversation about the Affordable Care Act is absolutely missing the point. For all the discussion of the Affordable Care Act, remember, Obamacare was not health care reform, it was health care insurance reform. And that is different. 
Why is it different? Because you're arguing about who's paying for health care, not what are we paying for. And the problem in health care is what are we paying for. Here's 2015 numbers. In the United States in 2015, we spent $9,400 per person per in that particular year for health care. Compare that to France, communist France, <laughs> which paid $5,400 pe per, per person per year. And to put this in context, they have a large share of seniors and a large share of low-skill immigrants, and yet for 40% less, they deliver roughly the same quality health care that we do. If you're not discussing this, you can't fix this problem. You cannot fix this, period. Now, why are costs so much higher? There are tons of reasons. No, it's not medical malpractice, but that's probably a little bit, or medical care fraud through Medicare, although that's probably a little bit of it. There's also a vastly more expensive system than any place else. Doctors in the US make insane amount of money relative to most any place else in the world. And of course, I can go through the healthcare ph pharmaceutical stuff and how crazy expensive that is. And you can go through a litany of issues as to why this is an incredibly shockingly expensive sector. And you cannot fix this until you talk about that. And here's the other part of it that people are totally ignoring. It's amazing to me. Trump, Clinton, they didn't like each other. I, I know that's a surprise, but they really didn't like each other. And on top of all that, they disagreed on everything with one exception. Throughout this campaign, the one thing they agreed we will not discuss is Medicare. Really. Right now, there are 45 million people on Medicare. In 20 years, it's going to be 76 million people on Medicare. Right now, Medicare is eating up 18.7% of federal revenues. In 20 years, at, what, at the pace we're going, it'll be 41%. Now, mind you, that's competing, of course, with Social Security, Medicaid, defense, infrastructure, and everything else the federal government does. This is why, holding all else constant with no changes, the Congressional Budget Office is expecting that by within four, three years, we're going to see an enormous widening of the federal deficit with no changes because of Medicare the one part of the federal budget that we will not discuss reform in. So how do we deal with this? We cut taxes. <laughs> <laughs> now mind you, we have the same problem here. I already mentioned the fact that our state is feeling very poor. With all the economic activity going on in the state, I talk to city after city, and the vast majority of cities are having a tough time. They're having budget difficulties. It's not because they're hiring lots of people. Public employment just, just got above the pre-recession peak. It's not because revenues haven't come in. Revenues at the, at the state level, higher than they've ever been. Billions of dollars of personal income taxes flowing into coffers, in part, of course, due to a strong economy and, of course, because of Prop 30 slash Prop 55. The problem is pensions and pension payments. Right now, to give you some sense of things, back in 1999, your average private sector worker, all in, wages and benefits, was earning about 40,000. Your average state and local, about 50,000. Today, the relevant numbers are 63,000 and 98,000. And to be clear, that's understanding the problem because that's based on payments on, uh, on, in terms of a 7% long-term CalPERS return. CalPERS last year earned a whopping 0.6%. They're probably going to be even lower than that this year. Maybe they'll match it 0.6% again. I don't know. But they're already talking about pushing their long-term returns on to 5.8%. And that is going to create incredible stresses on our regional governments. Got to have a conversation about this, folks. You can't pretend this is going to go away by itself. We have to face it, we have to discuss it, we have to figure out how to fix it. Pretending the problem doesn't exist doesn't get us to where we need to be. Now, cutting taxes, desperately important. According to an interview with the um, 
Economist, which I think you should all read the transcript of, came out this morning. Our uh, president said he's all about cutting taxes. And yes, he realizes we might have a couple of years of deficits, but he said it's prime in the pump. And to be clear, he then, look it up, two sentences later, claimed he invented the term priming the pump. <laughs> look it up. I'm not making it up. I was emailed this this morning. So is this really going to prime the pump? Well, first of all, a couple of reality checks. Corporate taxes, highest in the world, 35%. No one pays retail, honey. No one pays retail. The actual corporate taxes being paid are 20%, not 35%, 20%. Because we have a patronage system. Retail, 35%, and then you pay a lobbyist to give your industry special perks by paying off a congressman. So the actual payment is about 20%, which, by the way, is lower than it was under the Reagan administration. Yes, lower. And net corporate profits as a share of national income are much higher than they were under the Reagan administration. Corporations are not suffering. Now, mind you, we do need corporate tax reform, but reform is about flattening and making the system fair. It's about getting rid of patronage. And that's not what they're talking about. They said they want to take it from the 35% down to 15%. But listen to them, they're not going to get rid of most of those perks, most of those loopholes. So what does that actually mean? They're going to go from 20% to 0% in actuality? I'm not even sure how you can do that. And remember, they're talking about doing this in the context when we are already three years out from a massive widening of the deficit under our current tax situation. Well, it's going to lead to more investment. Really? Right now, investment, real investment as a share of GDP is already near an all-time high level for intellectual property and equipment. It's only weak for structures. And that's a whole separate issue having to do with the internet. There's no big gain here. The Laffer curve was laughable under the Reagan administration. And here we are, hearing the same nonsense that we are going to cut taxes in the midst of a growing fiscal deficit crisis. Amazing how out of tune with reality that is and of course, remember, if you cut corporate taxes, there's a whole other side effect, which is to take growing wealth inequality, which is already scary and way out of whack, and making it a lot worse. You know, look at the numbers. 50% of Americans are worth less today than they were in 1989. 90% of Americans were worth, worse off in 2013 than they were in 2001. Only the top 10% of Americans have seen their wealth increase consistently since 1989. And even in here, it's skewed to a top few percent. You do a corporate tax cut the way they're talking about, that is entire giveaway to this group. And you have fewer and fewer people becoming richer and richer, even as our nation's population is less and less prepared for the sharp pullbacks in public benefits that will occur because we simply cannot afford to pay for the things we promise people. As simple as that. To me, this is one of the most appalling, fisc ir fiscally irresponsible decisions ever made. You cannot cut, talk tax cuts until you fix Medicare, period. You just can't do this. Just can't do this. So the big picture, it's good. Things are going to be good. We're going to see 2 to 2.5% 2 growth over the course of this year. Uh, labor market's going to remain tight. Financial markets are a bit frothy, but I don't see any big issues. Interest rates will be okay. Exports are going to be so-so because of the high value dollar, but the global economy is getting a little better, and that helps. Business investment is already starting to pick up. We'll continue to do so. California is still going to be one of the strongest economies in the nation, but we are going to slow because we have run out of housing, and we have to deal with our housing situation, which we are not. As for the Trump factor themselves, look, I'd love to see infrastructure investments. Mortgage reform, very helpful. Government efficiency, always like to hear about it. Trade negotiations, we probably could get a better deal with China. I don't have any problem with that. On the other hand, the potential for a trade war is still there. This issues with immigration and the environment is still there. The fact that we're not talking about entitlements is still there. And of course, remember, if this administration truly, truly does fail, we may go from the far right to the far left. Because they'll say it again. Bernie Sanders was not a messiah. 
His views of the world were as out of touch in many ways as Trump's are. You, the truth's in the middle. <laughs> it plays in the middle where compromise is not a dirty word. That's where reality lies. But we don't seem to be able to refocus our attention on that truth in the middle. And that, not for me, is always the ongoing concern. We need to have that conversation. Now, last but not least, I've been asked this a couple times. I've got to give you my sports forecast. <laughs> and I will tell you this. It, 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 Chris, the economic forecaster, has been pretty good. Chris, the sports bookie, I'm out of business. <laughs> so I'm not going to say much. But really, Durant, how could you not? You know? It's kind of a given, right? But I'm not going to say, shh. I, have, I got bad karma. I got bad karma. But I'm hopeful. I'm very hopeful. So with that, thank you very much. And I guess we're going to have time for Q&A. OK, Chris. On. Okay, Chris, so we've got a few questions for Excellent. you. Um, first one is we're going to take it a little bit more local. Uh, and we're going to let you sit down, too, Ooh. So if you want well, to sit down. sit down. Okay, the, okay that you got the water. What are several strategies that cities can take to really hmm. help their... We have two chairs, so this is, this is better. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm fine standing, but I'm fine sitting, too. Please sit. <laughs> So tell me about your dreams. My, my, I, I, it's, it's been terrible. Yeah. So we've got cities. We're trying to keep retail establishments healthy. Mm. What are some strategies that cities can really undertake on a local level to keep these businesses? Right. Uh, look, re retail is having a tough time. Brick and mortar retail. It's the internet. And and candidly, first thing you got to do is be honest. Um, the world's changing from a purchase front. Uh, my this last Christmas, I I I told my wife. I'm going Christmas shopping, don't open my office door. <laughs> that's how people are doing it nowadays. And that's going to continue. It's the convenience is there, people love, love it, and, and as such, you're going to see this constant shift. Now, there are types of retail that continue to flourish. Um, destination retail is going to be the one you really want to think about. Destination retail is a place that people want to be at. I'm not going there because I just need to buy some stuff. I'm going there because I want to be there. And you think about these kind of new high-end various sorts of malls that are in place. Uh, I think in Los Angeles, the Grove or the Americana being these camp cons kind of things. So if you're going to do retail, you got to do it. You know, you got to have all the bells and whistles because that's the kind of thing that's going to keep people in. Um, the second thing, of course, is remember that people are never going to buy dinner over the internet. Uh, maybe a little bit, but in the end, they still want to be out. And uh, the restaurants and the restaurant scene, the entertainment scene is huge. Uh, we've seen huge advances here in Oakland itself on that particular front. The range of restaurants, stuff like that, those kind of things are doing well. But ultimately, your, your point is, is very well taken, which is you know, your traditional retail is going to suffer, and cities need to look how to replace that, that, particular, um, that particular revenue stream. The other thing that needs to go on, of course, is that um, cities and counties need to be pushing the state very hard for revenue reform particularly when it comes to the idea of a service sales tax. We have relied on a tax on a small portion of the economy for far too long. Um, there are some folks out there who have done some, have already started to push the idea of getting a service sales tax into place in the state. Um, and they're just sitting on it because, oh, God forbid, a few lawyers out there are annoyed that they might have to pay 1.5% on their legal fees, which is just not reasonable. So understand that traditional retail is getting undermined. You can fix that with a service sales tax, and it would be an enormous boon to local governments. But you've got to push your state representatives to get that actually in front and to move forward. Because it's sitting there. The idea is there. But it's not going anyplace. So you've got to push. You've got to push. OK, terrific. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about gentrification. Mm -hmm. Got a question here, and you mentioned that you know, we don't really have an affordable housing crisis. We need to build more housing. Right. But beyond that, how do cities deal with the gentrification, displaced, long-term residents having to move inland or to right. other states? Now more housing. Again, and, and more so housing. The, so, the, so the only answer, OK, but, and but, that's? But, but, here's, but here's, look. Okay, look. You have to take a step back and ask, okay, 
why does this occur? And, and I would say that there, there is um, uh, political reasons and financial reasons. And the political side is the ferocity of NIMBYism. And at some level, um, we, we, everybody in this room, needs to push back. When there is a city council and they're having a meeting on doing a zoning change to add a new apartment building, are you in that room saying yes? And Because if you're not, I'll tell you who is in the room, and that's all the NIMBYs who are losing their minds and saying it's the end of the world. Um, you you got to be in the room. you got to get involved. you got to make sure your city government understands that this is important to you. You need to support your mayor because, you know, a strong leader can, fit, can do this. You've seen it firsthand. Jerry Brown rolled into Oakland. He said, I want housing. And Jerry Brown got housing. It can be done. But again, the other part of it is the financial aspect. Most cities will tell you that workforce housing is a money loser. Because workforce housing, they consume a lot of public resources, and you don't get a lot of revenues. Well, again, that goes back to talking to Sacramento. You got to fix the system. Now, there's, here's some really radical things that will never happen, but I'll, here's a very honest one. Why is it that cities get taxable sales on the basis of where stuff is purchased rather than get taxable sales on the basis of the population they're supporting? I, I, I'm, again, I'm, you know, we're based in L.A., I look at places like Beverly Hills and, and, and Santa Monica that are phenomenally rich in terms of the money they receive because they are sitting on high-end shopping districts, whereas the city of LA, which is a home to the vast majority of people, on a dollar-per-dollar dollar basis gets vastly less per person. Well, I'm sorry, that's a miscarriage of justice. And there are ways of fixing that. Okay. So that's... You know, you, you got to get out there. System, Some reforms in Sacramento. And, and get the support of the business community to do these things. Absolutely. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the stock market. So it mm -hmm. seems to be responding favorably to Trump's um, plans, if we can call it it's that, responding for the economy. To, to, to corporate tax cuts. <laughs> to cor right. Because remember, if you have to pay less money to the government, that stock's worth more. This is not about Trump bump on expectations of, of more growth. This is entirely a play on corporate tax cuts. Uh, you know, will it continue? We'll see. How does the current political environment and the rapidly changing political current environment, given what happened with the firing of Comey and everything, how does that play into this? How does the market see this? I don't know. I'm not worried about the stock market being vastly overvalued, but I think they may be expecting a little too much. And they're not really considering the long-term impact of tax cuts. It's, very, it's a very short-term kind of thing we're seeing here because if you're not recognizing the fact that cutting taxes in the face of this enormous fiscal challenge in five years is shockingly irresponsible, but then again, the stock market doesn't look five years out. It's a very short-term sort of thing. So, you know, I'm not worried it's going to blow up tomorrow, but I do think it's being foolishly optimistic. Well, and beyond the proposed tax cuts, have you seen anything promising in any of his policies? Or have you seen any substance to any policies for you to base an opinion upon? No. Okay. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you, you I, I loved your introduction where you just said, we're not poised for a recession just because we're seven years, yeah, right, we've right. so far into seven years of good luck so far. Do you see any abnormalities in our regional economy that we've got to be worried about, other than housing, I think is the one And I don't think housing is an, even abnormal. Okay. Housing is exactly where it should be, given the dynamics of strong growth in the region and a lack of new supply. Housing is actually about right. I mean, it's really, this really is an income-based push in as much as the kind of churn that's happening. In fact, if you look at apartments, it's amazing. As much as apartment rents have come up, the actual burden on renters hasn't gone up much because a lot of the renters now are higher income. And that, some of that's because local residents are doing a little better, but a lot of it, again, has to do with the churn, the right. displacement. The dis the displacement. So you've got a little bit of both there. Um, so that's the, I don't think that's an issue as well. What, what would be an issue for the local economy? Um, yeah, any bubbles you yeah, see I, out I there? I don't. You know, I'm, I'm trying to find something bad to say about the East Bay. 
and I'm not finding it. Okay. I'm really not okay, finding but, and, it. And when, uh, I, I think, <laughs> but, I, but I do think, I mean, again, going back to this idea, I, I think that there are going to be social issues. I, I do and, think and, that well, And those that of us who are elected officials, it, are, yeah. we're experiencing those, and there's yeah. no question. The yeah. displacement of populations here and, in Oakland and you, got, and... you got this group screaming at you about displacement, and that group screaming at you about you know, in NIMBYism. Exactly. And you're wondering, you know, how do I, you know, how do I fix this? And, you know, there's not really any way. Um, except for to throw the NIMBYs out and yeah. get more housing. <laughs> so. Okay, so I think the takeaway today for all of us is get more housing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, and again, I think you pointed out um, pensions. Yeah. And those of us who are elected officials, we oversee pension funds, we negotiate with our labor groups. And it's rough right now. Were, were you able to wave your magic wand? What sort of pension reform would you want to see in California? Uh, well, I mean, look, you have to, um, the benefits have to be tailored to be more appropriate relative to the incomes of the people. Um, you have to have a longer period. You can't have this retired at 55 thing. That, that doesn't work anymore. People have to work a full lifespan nowadays. Um, and, and ultimately, I think the workers need to be contributing more to the system themselves. Uh, there are reforms you can put into place. Now, one of the biggest issues, of course, has to do with the fact that if you're going to do it under current law, you have to do all this with the new group and not so much to the folks that are already moving through the system. I'm not sure that's viable anymore. We may have gone too far. We may have to, to take a step back and realize that you're going to have to be, you're going to have to be a, little, a little tougher. And I don't, look, there's, I know lots of people in government, and I don't, I admire the people I work with and, and, I, and enjoy working with them, and I knew a lot of these folks are doing a hell of a good job, but we'd have to recognize that the system is simply not sustainable. And, and I don't know how you, how you fix that without having an honest conversation about it. Okay, I appreciate that. And I, that's the last of the questions from the audience. I'm willing to take one if someone wants to stand up and offer a question. Here, in fact, why don't you just, well, come, come over here and I'll hand you the microphone. So we, we want you for TV too, so here you go. I'm interested, good morning, great presentation. Thank you. Um, to get the most accurate information, what news sources do you use to avoid the spin or fake news? I stay away from the 24-hour news networks. I just completely stay away from the 24-hour news networks. I, 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 it's the, the, the stuff that passes for news on those guys is, it makes me crazy. And, um, uh, I, I, so I stay away from that. Uh, my, my news sources, and, ca candidly, I love The Economist. That's a great magazine. Uh, for those of you who don't pick it up, it's, it's really neat. And you, re you really got to read the transcript of this interview with Trump. It's, it's amazing. Um, and, and then uh, I, I, NPR. I love NPR. I'm sorry. I'm a huge NPR junkie. Uh, yeah, they're a little lefty, but that's okay. I love them. You know, and, uh, <laughs> Uh, I listen to them. I think they're still fairly balanced. The uh, um, uh, Washington Post, actually, I think is doing some great jobs at this particular point in time. So, you know, I, I look at some of the standard. Uh, actually, some of our local newspapers. I think the LA Times and the San Francisco B uh, Chronicle are, uh, do, do great stuff. So, um, you know, again, these, these are strong papers with a, good, with a good national presence. So they're out there. I, I think, in general, reading is better than listening. That, and, I, and I know that, that it's hard in this day and age for us to make that time. Um, but a lot of times I just think that, re that reading gives you better context. So. Okay, and with our final four minutes, we've yeah. got a great question. We haven't touched it upon, and that is cannabis as a yes. whole new business coming forward. What is that going to do to the state economy, not much. to vacancy rates? No, not much. It's, do it's, you see it? Yeah, no, it, it, manufacturing? You have, to, you have to take a deep breath, okay? <laughs> But don't inhale, is what he was really trying to say. But. It was totally unintentional, but I have to remember that line. You will. No, it's a really, it's, it, it fits. Deep breath. The cannabis is what we refer to as, a, it has a very inelastic demand curve, which means if you raise prices a lot, say through punishments and stuff like that, you don't see a real diminishment in, in consumption. But on the other hand, if prices come down a lot, you don't see a big increase either. And what you are seeing in the state right now is a massive amount of new production coming online. And 
as is happening in many places, uh, the prices are coming down pretty sharply. Uh, and so this idea that this is going to be a magical source of, say, government revenues, again, there's only X amount of weed um, the state can, will we'll want to consume, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, and, and as such, while I think it'll be maybe a part of your retail sector, I don't think it's gonna be a, a dominant part of it. And I, and I think there's too many cities who are looking at this as um, some sort of panacea, and I, I just don't see that being in place. Now, be that as it may, on the other side of it, I also know that uh, it's not going to be an enormous thing in the long run, but I still know, at least in the short run, there is money to be had if cities can actually start putting into place reasonable policies and monitor their policies accordingly. Um, Los Angeles City uh, was one of the first cities, for example, to put in a good sort of, over, sort of overview of what a medical marijuana and presumably recreational marijuana industry look like, and they have totally failed to enforce their own rules. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did a little study for a local group, and, and we, we figured out that the city was foregoing something on the order of 80 to 90 million dollars a year in revenues because of their unwillingness to enforce their own rules on the industry. And that's just nuts. So you want to make a plan, you want to enforce your plan, you want to make a part of, of the, your, your strategy bundle, but it's never going to be, you're never going to get as much money off, uh, out of cannabis as you will out of cars. Let's put it that way, okay? Okay, so. okay. and I think maybe we have time for one more question. Yes, please come on up here. This is more a comment for reaction. You've identified zoning as an issue and uh, concomitantly, higher density uh, use. Yeah. It seems to me the re uh, related factor is the outdoor recreational facilities to make that kind of dense housing palatable to the resident. L I love and it, I absolutely, care. absolutely. And, and this goes back to the idea that it's not about growth, it's about smart growth, right? Which I, can, I understand can be a cliched overused term, but it goes back to the idea that you have to have a plan. To not have a plan uh, can create bad growth. But what you want to have is this idea where you create zones of densification and you supply those zones of densification with the infrastructure support they need to succeed. You build it around transit zones. You attach to it large park type areas where people can get outside and have some fresh air. You want to have within that facility a range of services, healthcare, retail right there so people don't have to get in a car to do basic things like eat dinner, get groceries, and go see a doctor. Uh, there are ways of doing that, but you have to have those plans in place. And again, that's a function of, of making sure you work with your local governments to have appropriate plans. Um, growth is here. The East Bay is, I have never seen the East Bay economy, and I've been studying this place since 2002, 2003, something like that. I've never seen the economy as strong it's vibrant, with so much opportunity as what is going on in the East Bay right now. You are in the center of an absolute renaissance. But it goes back to that one question, and I'll say, ask you one more time. Is this a renaissance for everybody? Or is it a renaissance for those who can afford to be here? It's your decision to make. It's your decision to make. Thank you very much, everybody. Always great to be here.